Hey, Jeremy. Yes. It's me. Oh, um, sorry. My cat. Oh. Um, can you I, I, I like it when cats are in the group. It was actually very sweet. Can you say more about the dreams about helplessness and the, that helplessness is precisely what we need to look at? Because I said I don't remember my dreams. Actually, yeah. the ones I do remember, I remember waking up feeling extremely helpless. Yeah. Like overwhelming yeah. feeling. And a perfectly reasonable response is, well, that doesn't help. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to. It just feels like more of the same, right? Exactly. Exactly. Now my, again, I can't ask you to take my word for it, but my experience says there will be value in recording as much detail from those dreams where my primary experience is feeling helpless and hopeless, that getting into the habit of recording them will make it easier to see what is actually possible in terms of transforming those feelings. Everything I know says that if that, as, as the pool players would say, if that shot was not on the table, I wouldn't even remember the dream. I suspect for theoretical reasons I would still have it, but it would be a moot point because I wouldn't remember it. And helplessness in general, I mean, you and I would have to talk in a great deal more detail for me to say, gosh, Meg, imagining being you, my dream has this and this and this to say about it. But in general, dreaming of helplessness is not an unusual circumstance. And more often than not, in my experience, the helplessness at some level is self-imposed and sometimes it's imposed by moral restraint it looks like what's making me helpless is what would be easily recognized as adult mature responsible moral restraint unless that is re-examined unless the full force of my evolving psyche, for lack of a better term, is brought to the question of, is that really true? Am I really helpless? Well, I could kill so-and-so. Yikes. I don't want to do that. If it were, if it were a dream that upset me, I dreamed I killed so-and-so. I would say in the dream world, death is not the only, but the single most frequent and reliable metaphor of profound psycho-spiritual growth and change that the psyche has to offer. And that whenever anyone or anything dies or is destroyed, it's worth remembering in the dream world that the shamans are right, that everything is alive including the things that we would categorize as, uh, uh, what's, what's the word for it, inanimate. That even the inanimate things in the dream world are alive, and whenever anything is killed or destroyed in the dream world, what's actually happening is that the life energy that was obligated to appear in that form is released from that obligation. Suddenly, the life energy is free of that limiting form. And like hot rock dropped into water, it will immediately assume the new shape that corresponds to the new situation. So there's way worse things in the dream world than death. And the desire to kill somebody or something or destroy something is ultimately, in my experience, a very strong symbol of the desire to change. But change of that order is always unnerving. You know, one of the things I experienced over the decades of teaching dream work at the GTU is that there were, at least in terms of the population as a whole, a disproportionate number of students who were actively, consciously working to deepen their spiritual lives. 
And every once in a while, they would dream about suicide. And they would wake up totally distressed and unhappy when in fact those dreams were some of the strongest affirmations that their efforts to deepen their spiritual lives were actually succeeding. And that there was conscious choice to remove life energy from the very person who decided to undertake these efforts to begin with. Because if the person who decided to undertake the efforts to begin with did not change as a result of those efforts, then the efforts themselves would fail. And paradoxically, nightmares of death regularly were affirmations of the success of those efforts. But often at the cost of losing some kind of immature faith in the authority of the tradition that they were devoted to. You know, one of the problems with authentic spiritual development, as I suspect everyone in this room already knows, is that old loyalties sometimes dissolve. Old friendships sometimes lose their their charge because my old friends were friends with who I used to be and really don't like who I'm becoming that much. And it's a very high price to pay. It's certainly, as I know you know, Meg, symbolized in the waking world by coming out. Coming out in the waking world is a form of suicide. Because the one who was keeping the secret is toast. The life energy that animated that person is no longer animating that person. It's animating somebody else. And it's at a price. Often a huge price. But in the long run, it's the only game in town. It's the only real thing that can be done. And I, what I'm suggesting is that all of us, because of this debacle, this electoral debacle, are in a position to come out about who we really are, and the price may be equally onerous, but it's equally important. It's equally necessary for us to do it. And again, I would guess just theoretically that the dreams that folks are sharing with you have that quality to them. And my experience suggests the best thing that can be done is to say, well, in my imagined version of the waking life story that you're telling me and these dreams which you're bringing to this conversation is that they are about a choice that I've already made unconsciously to grow past the limitations that I thought were absolutely necessary for the preservation of my life. And to have sensitive guides and companions in the midst of transformation like that is, well, you don't need me to tell you how important it is. It's why we do what we do. You know, some of you know that one of the things I'm doing now is writing and drawing comic books. And I have a couple percolating about essentially the rise of fascism in America. And my hope is that because they come in a comic book form, they may reach a wider audience than the Unitarian Universalist choir that I preach to all the time anyway. <laughs> uh, so that, in answer to your question earlier, Carl, that's one of the things I'm breaking form. I've been a writer all my life, but... 
like most published writers, my nose goes up a little bit when I encounter comic books. I go, oh, well. Do you know um, Jeffrey Kripal, K-R-I-P-A-L, his book, mm -hmm. Mutants and Mystics? Yep. Yeah. Profound, really yeah. profound. Indeed. His, I would suggest his history of Esalen. I've read everything he's written. He's yeah, well. Amazing. We have tastes in common. Yeah. I think he's wonderful. My suspicion is that if he were here, he would laugh and throw in a couple of examples out of his own experience. Certainly there are enough examples like that in what he's written. Mm -hmm. And we're all being called to shed whatever skins we've been living with. And the sense of hopelessness is a fairly precise perception that the skin I've been living with is too small to do what I know needs to be done. And yeah. if I couldn't do more, Meg, to get back to your question, if I couldn't do more, everything I know says I wouldn't even remember those dreams. But in fact, those dreams are coming over the wall and going through the moat full of alligators and cutting their way through the razor wire and tiptoeing through the minefields and coming to the land of memory anyway. And even if they're a little, a little ragged and tiny and not particularly attractive, there's reasons for that. Those are the, those are the heroic dreams that made it through. And I kick them to the curb and they still come. I, I realize that from your point of view, that's not an exciting story, but I hope you can see that from my point of view, it's an immensely exciting story. Yeah, actually, no, I did get excited because I was thinking about how, you know, um, Obama has deported more people than any other president, two and a half million people. And I haven't had nightmares about it. Yeah. I'm not going to sleep, you know, yeah. and I think um, global warming and global climate change has been totally real and escalating. And I go on and live the life I've lived. And so I think I can imagine that similarly to coming out and yeah. that's nice of you to use something that I'm so familiar with. 